Hello, today we are going to work on Epicureanism and Stoicism. Uh, I'll uh, divide our lesson today in uh, two parts, so in the first part uh, we'll talk about Epicureanism and in the second part uh, we'll work on Stoicism. Um, both schools uh, can be considered the part of uh, uh, normative ethics, remember? And the normative ethics uh, had uh, three other schools, uh, uh, deontological ethics, uh, consequentialist ethics, uh, and uh, virtue ethics. Uh, of course, many more than this, but uh, we just uh, uh, worked on these three. Uh, Epicureanism and Stoicism can be considered uh, two schools belonging to virtue ethics. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Similarly to consequentialist ethics, uh, uh, virtue ethics uh, is uh, a teleological form of ethics, uh, meaning uh, it's uh, an ethics that is uh, uh, directed to uh, uh, the understanding of the telos, uh, is grounded more on the goal of uh, uh, the action rather than its uh, uh, premise, as uh, it could be for uh, the deontological ethics. Now, Epicureanism is a school that, is, uh, uh, that, uh, that takes its name from Epicurus, uh, the founder. Um, Epicurus lived, uh, was born in 307 before Christ, so we are talking about uh, ancient Greece. And although this school takes the name from uh, him, uh, it's a school that uh, um, became popular not only in Greece but in Rome and still today uh, is uh, it, it has its acolytes. Um, the Epicureans are also uh, called the philosophers of the Kepos. Why? Uh, because uh, the Kepos is uh, uh, the garden. Kepos is uh, uh, the Greek name for a garden and uh, they used to take their lessons uh, in a garden. This uh, gives you immediately the flavor of uh, uh, this kind of uh, school, uh, which is uh, um, based, uh, fully based on uh, edone. Uh, edone is again another Greek word to say pleasure. So the telos in this case uh, is uh, to feel pleasure. Of course, uh, this kind of pleasure is not exactly uh, what we mean today by pleasure, we'll see what uh, kind of pleasure uh, Epicureans uh, uh, were seeking. And now let's start uh, with uh, an example, a very uh, common example. Let me drink. Okay, falling in love, beautiful. I hope everyone can experience uh, something like that uh, more than once. Um, in his or her life. Uh, when you fall in love, uh, um, every problem somehow magically disappears. Uh, you are not anxious anymore about uh, things, uh, you are not worried. Uh, somehow uh, light becomes brighter uh, and uh, um, you experience changes in yourself uh, that you would have never expected. What happens? Why uh, does that happen? Because uh, you experience a sense of pleasure that is very close to uh, what uh, Epicureanism um, um, would uh, describe. Um, there is a psychotherapist, uh, uh, a Jungian one, uh, Guggenhul Prague. Mm, I hope my pronunciation is close to the right one of this name. Um, this psychotherapist considered Eros, he wrote this beautiful book, Eros on Crutches, uh, he considered the Eros a, 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 a powerful force uh, before which uh, the ego can just surrender. Uh, so Eros uh, is uh, very close to this uh, powerful uh, self uh, that is not just our self uh, but it's a kind of uh, an absolute strength uh, that uh, is uh, um, in front of us and we surrender to that and we enjoy this flow and uh, we become part of it. So uh, we experience uh, a sense of pleasure that uh, uh, helps us to understand our self better and uh, um, 
it's uh, a form of pleasure that is uh, egoless because uh, it's true our ego is absolutely happy to experience this sense of <clears throat> good uh, feelings but it's not the owner of these feelings a love uh, amor che ratto mi prese uh, Dante uh, wrote a love is something that uh, possesses you it's something that happens to you you are not the master of it you are not in control of it so um, we might say that uh, uh, Epicureans uh, are those uh, who experiences uh, uh, who takes uh, uh, are those who take pleasure seriously who study seriously what pleasure is uh, and uh, help individuals uh, to attain pleasure uh, there's this um, document a letter to Menetius, uh, uh, sorry first a letter to Herodotus uh, that uh, uh, contain uh, the basic teachings of uh, Epicurus uh, and of his uh, doctrine doctrine According to Epicurus, uh, according to his uh, psychology, our uh, psyche, uh, Greek word uh, to say psyche, uh, meaning breath, uh, vital breath uh, that is inside of us, uh, our psyche is uh, a compound of atoms. So Epicurus' theory starts from uh, um, Democritus, and Leucippus theory according to which uh, we are uh, the world is uh, made of uh, small uh, uh, atoms uh, uh, small particles that uh, we might not see but they are there and they are uh, the smallest particle is the indivisible one and we call it atom um, these atoms uh, uh, combine with each other uh, according to a cleanamen, according to inclination that is uh, random and uh, casual and uh, there's no divine plan we are just uh, a compound of uh, these um, of, of uh, these atoms uh, that uh, Flowed in uh, the void uh, and uh, make uh, the things uh, as they are. This means that uh, there's an absolute freedom and uh, there's uh, it, and uh, in this freedom uh, we have no divine plan to accomplish. Uh, we are free to be in charge of our life without having the weight of uh, fulfill. Uh, some kind of divine plan that is uh, waiting for us uh, so we are uh, just a living body without a specific future to accomplish uh, we cannot be acted upon because uh, we are just a free atoms uh, that randomly combine with each other and uh, then uh, what's the sense of it uh, What's the ethics behind it? What's the psychology uh, that is implied in this uh, physical and uh, psychological stance? Basically, what they say is that uh, since we are not in control of everything, since we are absolutely free, uh, better to take a seat and enjoy, enjoy the uh, wonderful uh, mysteries of life. Since we are not in control of our body, uh, of our our uh, mm, life or what can happen to us uh, of the universe uh, better to spend our life uh, in a true enjoyment of what is given to us uh, before I mentioned uh, being in control of uh, uh, our atoms, of uh, uh, our lives, uh, in this sense, uh, being in control uh, by surrendering uh, our egos uh, that try to keep everything in order and uh, uh, controlling all that uh, could happen. So surrendering that to this uh, big power that we might call love or a self or consciousness or uh, logos and so forth. Um, I decided to mention the Epicurean school uh, uh, in this class uh, because um, I consider Epicurus uh, uh, 
one of the greatest psychologists uh, in his letter to Menachos, uh, uh, he tried uh, to heal his uh, clients, uh, his uh, students uh, from uh, the basic anxieties that might uh, hit the human being in uh, uh, the course of his or her life. Uh, existential philosophers and psychologists took inspiration from uh, his uh, letter uh, and, or from his teachings. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Yalom, Eugene Yalom, for example. Um, in this letter of Menachos, to Menachos, uh, he proposed a tetrapharmagos. Tetrapharmagos is a word that means a tetra for. Greek for four and pharmacos medicine. So in the tetrapharmacos, uh, uh, it basically it suggests people uh, to take uh, this kind of medicine in order to heal uh, the sense of anxiety that might uh, hit uh, in a particular moment of his or her life. Uh, so instead of taking Prozac, uh, better to use the tetrapharmacos. Um, the tetrapharmacos uh, uh, tries to heal uh, um, four of the basic anxieties that might hit an individual. The anxiety of death. Uh, we, we can't deny that our existence is going to end, so better to take uh, responsibility of, for that, uh, better to be aware of it uh, and uh, enjoy uh, what uh, we have. And uh, it's end. So, uh, to the problem of dying, um, Epicurus replies by saying, uh, not be anxious, not be afraid, uh, don't be afraid of dying, because uh, when death comes, uh, you'll not be there, and when you'll be there, uh, death will not be there. So, um, dying is something that cannot uh, interest you personally, because uh, <clears throat> Uh, you can't uh, encounter death uh, since we are body and uh, this body combined and disrupt uh, and there is no soul uh, so your soul is not going to meet uh, death uh, while your body is going to die because uh, you are one with your body and when this body is going to die you will not be there anymore nice story <clears throat> That might help. Attached to that, there is the problem of uh, feeling pain. So it's true that dying would uh, bring you pain. Uh, but what they say is that pain is uh, <clears throat> um, just a momentary state of mind. Pain is something that uh, changes uh, our... Uh, um, um, present state is something that uh, changes uh, our habitual state of mind. So it's something that cannot ever last. And if uh, it does last, then uh, we'll find a way to get used to that. So pain is not something we should be afraid of because uh, it would uh, change uh, our normal uh, being, our normal behavior, uh, but not forever, because then uh, we'll find another balance. Uh, then there is another uh, anxiety that uh, is connected to um, uh, being afraid of gods. I use gods because that was a polytheistic society. Uh, we might say God today, so we are uh, feeling uh, somehow overwhelmed by the um, almighty power of these gods, and so uh, um, we are superstitious about that, and uh, we are afraid that God is going to punish us uh, if uh, we don't uh, pray uh, it enough, or uh, we don't um, do uh, what uh, uh, these uh, um, mysterious will uh, wants from us. Uh, to that, uh, uh, Epicurus said, uh, uh, "Don't, uh, uh, don't be, um, don't let yourself uh, be overwhelmed by uh, religio in the sense, in the Lucretian sense of the word. I mean, uh, by these uh, mm, superstitious thoughts. Uh, just." Mm, 
<clears throat> just think that uh, God is uh, a happy, loving God. Uh, don't uh, project on this God as uh, something that belongs to your side. If it's Almighty, it doesn't uh, need uh, your life, it doesn't need uh, your pain, it doesn't need your suffering. Uh, just uh, um, live your life and take from uh, it uh, all that it can give you. Then uh, the fourth. Uh, um, reason of anxiety is uh, that of uh, losing our ability to feel uh, pleasure becoming uh, anhedonic uh, well it says uh, that pleasure is uh, the condition of our life instead idone is uh, the goal of uh, uh, this uh, technic view, this uh, technology of life uh, that Epicurus is uh, um, building, uh, fine-tuning in his uh, lab. Um, of course, this kind of pleasure is, uh, as I as I said, uh, as I mentioned before, is not the adrenalinic pleasure we might uh, think of today. It's not that uh, form of pleasure that we can have uh, if we get an A in a class. Uh, we work, 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 and then we get an A. Uh, that is exactly the opposite as pleasure, because uh, that kind of event is going to... Uh, mm, disturb uh, the balance of our soul, of our peace. The real goal, the eudaimonia, the happiness uh, that pleasure can bring in our life comes from our ability to reach ataraxia. That's the word. Ataraxia comes from atarahe. Tarahe is uh, uh, this sense of uh, disturb and um, harass, perturbability, uh, disorder, and a uh, is the privative of uh, all this. So uh, ataraxia is that form of happiness that we can reach when we are serene, placid, when everything is absolutely flat without any kind of wave and anxiety disturbs the movement. So this kind of pleasure would be the reason for um, some kind of a change that is going to disturb the serenity of your being. So real pleasure is that pleasure that comes from enjoying uh, your fully your body, your uh, uh, senses, uh, your uh, feelings, uh, uh, without uh, being bothered, without being excited, uh, without uh, being moved, uh, actually, by it. So it's a sense of pleasure that is going to uh, um, reinforce your sense of serenity. So from this point of view, uh, the sense of hedonism, as we mean it today, uh, you are hedonistic, you think only of your pleasure and there's nothing else, is far, far away from uh, what Epicureans meant, because uh, uh, the sense of pleasure uh, uh, that uh, represents the goal of uh, this uh, life uh, that uh, Epicurus envisions uh, is uh, a form of pleasure that is uh, egoless, that is not uh, built on uh, the achievements that uh, the ego has uh, uh, to get uh, and uh, uh, the form of uh, life that uh, it planned uh, for uh, this particular human being. Uh, it's instead the opposite. It's a form of pleasure that comes from surrendering to um, the peace of the universe, uh, to the spectacular, the wondrous beauty of the universe and taking pleasure of it without being uh, uh, moved by any desire of possessing, controlling, uh, foreseeing uh, uh, its moves and uh, um, its properties. I hope it makes sense um, because it might be um, a useful technique uh, for uh, 
life in general today too and in fact uh, uh, there are uh, uh, psychotherapists uh, like uh, Lowen for example uh, who uh, took pleasure uh, as seriously as uh, Epicureans did uh, and uh, was uh, somewhat influenced by Epicureans although he was uh, um, as a student of Reich and like a student of Freud, more influenced by uh, Freud's position. But after all, Freud on its own, on his own was influenced by Plato and uh, um, uh, other uh, ancient Greeks ancient Greek philosophers so uh, it's uh, an ongoing dialogue with uh, with history and with human thinking after all so I was saying that these uh, um, these um, psychotherapists Alexander Lowen uh, wrote this beautiful book on pleasure and in this book uh, <clears throat> Uh, he uh, reflected on uh, the opposite of pleasure, on the feeling that can be put exactly at the opposite uh, extreme as pleasure, to pleasure. Uh, so uh, he, he thought that the opposite of pleasure is not pain, because pain would represent one of the many other feelings uh, that we might experience in our life and um, can be different certainly from pleasure but not exactly the opposite the opposite of pleasure could be uh, even sorrow or anxiety or uh, uh, desperation and so on and so on so according to him uh, the opposite of pleasure is a power because a power is uh, uh, that kind of placebo that uh, people uh, uh, seek in order to not feel uh, what uh, he, realize, uh, he realizes in uh, his diagnosis of uh, present time is that uh, we are afraid of feeling white, uh, sorry, uh, of feeling what? Uh, feeling uh, uh, something that might uh, go against uh, the uh, plans uh, we have for us, uh, of the status quo that somehow we uh, find uh, pleasant uh, uh, and uh, reassuring so we are afraid of feeling because a feeling might uh, spoil uh, that sense of well-being uh, that sense of uh, control we think we have on our life so power is the opposite of pl as pleasure to pleasure because uh, power obliges us to um, reinforce our ego it's a placebo that we think will work uh, but in fact it lasts just the time of um, uh, a very rapid change so through power we can get money uh, we can um, with this money buy new things uh, and then the sense of empty emptiness uh, uh, takes over and uh, grows uh, uh, bigger and bigger in our body it becomes a bodily feeling so a uh, pleasure should be according to lower uh, a sort of a phronesis uh, to use uh, Aristotle's word uh, a, a sort of a practical rationality that would uh, help us to monitor ourselves more than uh, our egos and uh, uh, to um, help us to know where we are, what we are feeling and uh, uh, where do we want to do independently of what, where we planned uh, to go. Uh, so in this sense, uh, both Epicureanism and Stoicism are schools that are particularly helpful for uh, um, uh, this present society uh, because uh, um, both these schools uh, uh, were uh, uh, founded uh, in a moment of uh, great upheavals in Greek society and uh, <clears throat> they encouraged uh, human beings to take care of uh, its own soul and uh, um, find uh, uh, a psychological balance that could have been enduring independently of uh, the external changes. Um, 
so it's uh, a, a kind of encouragement to take care of the inner citadel instead of the outer one. Uh, in that sense, uh, considering the political distress in which we are living today, uh, Stoicism and Epicureanism are becoming a uh, uh, technite to build technologies of life that are uh, uh, more and more helpful today. Uh, trying to find our inner balance independently of what uh, can uh, um, happen outside is um, a powerful means to uh, reach a fulfilling life. Now, Stoicism. Stoicism was uh, the big uh, rival to Epicureanism and vice versa, although their uh, approach to life uh, seems to be somewhat similar. Stoicism was uh, founded by Zeno of Chitium in the 3rd century before Christ, and uh, mm, in a way that is similar to Epicurus, uh, uh, Zeno tried to fight uh, the um, attitude of uh, um, um, being scared of feelings uh, and uh, uh, cope with this uh, fear with uh, addic with uh, anesthetic. So basically uh, what could happen today and what would have happened before is that uh, if we feel something, uh, if we feel pain uh, or if we feel extreme excitement then we take an anesthetic. The word anesthetic comes from Greek uh, and it means the uh, absence of feelings. So we take something uh, that uh, a drug that helps us to not feel anything. Uh, it can't be the solution. Uh, the, um, the technique that uh, uh, Zeno uh, proposed is that of uh, taking responsibility for what you are feeling, uh, understanding what is inside that feeling, uh, being honest with that uh, without repressing that feeling, but being with that. And, uh, uh, then uh, not identifying yourself and uh, not freezing yourself uh, in that feeling. So not allow, uh, you shouldn't allow uh, yourself uh, to be possessed by that feeling, which doesn't mean that you are rejecting it uh, thoroughly, but it means that uh, you felt it and then uh, uh, you decided that you are not that. You are not one with that feeling. So it's a way of uh, taking responsibility for uh, your feelings and decide uh, what to do with that. And this is, is, this is grounded on uh, a psychology and the physics that is uh, uh, very precise and peculiar to uh, Stoic thought. Uh, because according to Stoicism, our psyche, our psyche, is uh, again, as it was for Epicureans, uh, a corporeal and uh, an intelligent uh, um, psyche. Uh, the intelligence of God is distributed in all our body, but again, it's the intelligence of God. So, uh, according to Stoics, uh, there's this uh, animating principle uh, that is an intelligent principle uh, and uh, enlivens, uh, animates uh, us. Uh, they call it uh, pneuma. Um, divine breath and uh, we are that breath at the same time we are that uh, uh, sameness uh, and um, whole at the same time we are interconnected with each other uh, by this uh, um, intelligent force uh, um, that we can call a breath, we can call uh, logos or love, um, it's a force that makes this cosmos an oikos for everyone and cosmos is a beautiful word because it means at the same time harmony, order. Uh, so they are a teleological principle uh, differently from um, the Epicurean principle uh, is such uh, that uh, we live according to a, a, an intelligent 
plan. So our uh, own breathing is uh, something divine and uh, uh, it's uh, somehow an answer, a response to what happens to our life. So according to them, we are constantly um, reacting with our eyes, with our sensations to or my, to impulses that challenge uh, our present, our life. And then to these challenges, we react by deciding to accept or not the challenge and uh, now this seems something uh, uh, somehow outlandish because uh, um, thinking that uh, our uh, exhalation our uh, breathing uh, might uh, have a decisional power on our cognitive uh, psychological uh, and spiritual life uh, seems to be something far away from reality um, which is not necessarily so if we think of um, Eastern uh, forms of uh, meditation, meditative practices, uh, or uh, even uh, uh, psychotherapeutic uh, approaches like uh, bioenergetic, uh, um, in which uh, we work uh, to, on our psyche through our um, a respiration or even you know the very common classes that the pregnant women take in order to um, get prepared to this uh, um, miraculous event of giving birth to their babies so uh, it's a very old ancient principle that of paying attention to our um, breath as a, a vital principle for uh, our knowledge, our spiritual balance, our psychological well-being. So there's uh, this uh, sentient uh, exhalation that determines, uh, um, for example, uh, um, the, the, that uh, evaluates uh, the data that we know in uh, that we come in contact with uh, while we are uh, uh, learning something and then it's uh, from this uh, evaluating moment that we uh, organize the data and uh, uh, assign the value of truth or uh, um, falsity to um, the data or uh, uh, the same for uh, um, the um, attitude we want to uh, assume in relation to something that is happening to us. Uh, so we live uh, an experience that is uh, uh, particularly um, uh, distressing for us, then we decide to again take responsibility for what we feel and then assume an attitude that might uh, identify ourselves uh, with that uh, distress uh, or uh, we might decide to um, take control for uh, where we are. So the goal of this school is uh, to be anetic, to be virtuous, to be uh, uh, someone who is able to uh, take care of uh, him or herself. In his beautiful meditations, uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, um, tried to put in practice uh, this uh, Epimeleia uh, 202. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was uh, one of the last Roman emperor and a Stoic, and he wrote uh, this beautiful uh, journal uh, while he was uh, fighting on camps, so he, he needed to find a way to be uh, in touch with himself, uh, to be uh, able to have uh, control for what he was going to do, not just for himself, but for his troops, for his reign. Uh, so uh, in this journal, uh, he uh, meditated about um, his feelings, his emotions, uh, and uh, manage to um, take control over his life. So when we say, um, well, you are a stoic, um, 
we're not necessarily uh, uh, talking about someone who is very harsh, who is uh, a solitary person who loves being in pain and so on. Now, this is somehow uh, the prejudices that have been piled up around uh, this, uh, this term. Uh, being a stoic means uh, also being aware to read uh, the book of your life, uh, being able to interpret it uh, and uh, take the best uh, out of it. Uh, so, um, apathia, the extirpation of the passions, uh, which is something that uh, Chrysippus uh, uh, preached, uh, is not necessarily um, the way through which you detach yourself from your life but is a way uh, it's an invitation to read your passions to um, be aware of it without immediately judging them as wrong and repressing them so being able to feel uh, these passions uh, and uh, find uh, through them uh, a peace. I mean, uh, 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 discovering that uh, you are not necessarily this roller coaster of feelings uh, and uh, uh, you can have um, an apathic life. Uh, meaning uh, a life uh, that not necessarily identify with uh, this uh, uh, path, uh, with uh, these uh, passions. Apathic uh, uh, means exactly the absence of uh, passions. Now, today, passions has, uh, uh, passion has a meaning that seems uh, mostly positive, adventurous, romantic, uh, sensuous, and so on. Uh, passion uh, in Greek. Uh, Pasching means suffering, so patience is something that can bring you uh, suffering and uh, you can avoid that uh, by being uh, aware of them, uh, not identifying with them and uh, um, experiencing them somehow. Don't allow them to take control over you. So there's this uh, beautiful book, uh, the letter to letters to Lucilium uh, that uh, Seneca wrote. Uh, Lucilium is just uh, himself; uh, he is trying to calm himself down. I mean, he was uh, the teacher of Nero, a uh, very difficult student indeed. Uh, so he had to find a way to um, uh, find peace and a sense for. Uh, uh, what he was living and uh, um, there's this line this uh, very first line uh, in this book in which he says vindicate tibi so find a way to um, own yourself to be responsible for yourself to read the sense find a sense for what you're living um, that's the bottom line we might say of this uh, of this school um, the goal is uh, to find uh, happiness in being a virtuous person and being a virtuous person means uh, being able to uh, reach uh, apathia to reach uh, a stability uh, that uh, um, might help you uh, to uh, find the reason why you are living this uh, and not another life, um, allow you to feel uh, connected uh, to not just uh, your sorrows and uh, uh, then die in uh, uh, an ocean of uh, self-pity, but find uh, uh, the reason why you are living what you're living and uh, uh, see how your uh, uh, life might be useful for uh, the other person that is connected to you, that is uh, uh, in the same oikos, in the same house as, uh, as yours. Your telos, your goal life, uh, your vocation is interconnected with uh, another person's vocation and uh, might help uh, the other person to fulfill uh, its telos. So it's not necessarily the philosophy of solitude, of course, in order to um, put in practice uh, this uh, self-sifting uh, of uh, your soul, uh, you need uh, solitude, uh, but it's uh, a very interconnected uh, solitude. And uh, the virtuousness uh, you are going to get is uh, not just one virtue, 
mm, that's the other thing that it might be helpful to emphasize in uh, Freud school. Uh, so uh, you are not just, uh, um, I don't know, loyal or uh, um, a good friend or courageous. Uh, according to them, uh, virtues are uh, all similar. It changes the level of, uh, uh, basically, uh, it's a difference in degrees more than uh, quality. Uh, so the quality is always the same. Being able to be apathic, being able to be responsible for what you feel and uh, uh, realizing that you are not just that feeling, uh, but you are able to see through that. Uh, then this disposition would allow you to be courageous if you are responding to a situation in which uh, you have to decide whether to uh, embrace this feeling or loyal uh, and so on and so on. So uh, the different virtues are just different ways uh, to respond to the situation according to that disposition. So that's all. Uh, these are the two big schools uh, that I wanted to uh, introduce you today uh, in order to make your greetings uh, in uh, class uh, a little bit easier. And uh, these two schools are certainly important for uh, an overview of uh, normative ethics, are certainly schools that still affect uh, our lives uh, uh, together. Uh, and today. Uh, so um, if you have questions, uh, you know, you can find me at uh, susie.fervello at gmail.com and uh, have a good day. Bye.